America's number one national television program on Asia. Hello, I'm Yu Sai Khan. Welcome to Looking East. Tonight we're going to take you to a very special place in Beijing, China, one that has never been open to Western television before, the former residence of Chairman Mao. Then we'll visit with Deng Bufang, the son of China's leader Deng Xiaoping. During the Cultural Revolution, Deng Bufang was punished for being an intellectual, was pushed out of a second floor window, and was crippled for life. He is now the director of the China Welfare Fund for the Handicapped. We'll be back in a moment. The name Mao Zedong was synonymous with China for over a quarter of a century, from 1949 when the People's Republic of China was founded until his death in 1976. More than a decade later, hordes of visitors still wait in line every day to see his mausoleum in Beijing. The fascination with Mao, the legend, persists, while Mao, the man, has become somewhat elusive. We had hoped to gain some personal insight into the late chairman, how he lived, what made him tick, when we were granted permission to film at his residence in Zhongnanhai. Zhongnanhai, which literally means Central and South Seas, is an island off the Beihai Lake front in Beijing. It is the seat of government. First built by Chinese rulers as early as 916 AD, Zhongnanhai was the palace of recreation for the emperors of many dynasties. Zhongnanhai was expanded to its present size during the Ming Dynasty from the 14th to the 17th centuries, but most of the present buildings were constructed during the Qing Dynasty between 1644 and 1911. After the overthrow of the dynastic rule, it became the presidential house of Chiang Kai-shek. And since the founding of the People's Republic in 1949, it's been the seat of communist power. The Politburo and the Party Central Committee have their offices here, and many of China's top leaders live here as well. As early as 1960, when this picture was taken, Ma was meeting at Zhongnanhai with top leaders, including Deng Xiaoping. That's him with his back to the camera. It is also the place where important foreign guests are received. It is here, too, where some important Chinese Communist Party and state meetings take place. In the ornate sitting rooms and conference rooms where once the emperors luxuriated. Through the years, Chairman Mao called several of these buildings home, but Feng Ziyuan was his favorite. Feng Ziyuan means the garden of benevolence and prosperity. Here is where he lived and worked the longest, and where he held meetings with his closest associates. Zhou Wenlai was probably his closest, but Deng Xiaoping was there too. 
Chairman Mao lived in this house from 1949, soon after the founding of the People's Republic, until 1966, for a total of 17 years. One thing for sure, you find a lot of books in this house. This is the bed that he actually slept on. You can tell that the, this is a very hard bed. It's a wooden bed. He didn't like soft beds. And the interesting thing is that right next to it is this piles and piles of books. It's fascinating to see the kind of things he read. Classics, Chinese classics. Song Dynasty poems, Dream of the Red Chamber, Chinese history, Lenin's What to Do. And this is his own writing. Also, the interesting thing is that he, he studied English. This is the desk the Chairman Mao used. I understand that he used to work until very, very late at night. He loved to work at night. And as you can tell, this is the calendar. On, on this day, he left this house. It was August 18, 1966. Now, Chairman Mao used both pencils, Western u u writing utensil, and Chinese brushes. And of course, we all know that his handwriting was absolutely beautiful. And of course, this is the ink well that he used to use. And we also find out that he was a, a very big smoker. <laughs> you can see ashtrays all over the house. This is where Chairman Mao ate his three meals a day. You notice that these are very simple utensils. This is only a wooden pair of chopsticks. Uh, it is documented that his favorite food uh, was bitter melon and uh, hot pepper. He's from Honan province, that's the reason why. And the food usually is delivered from the kitchen in the back in a little box like this, very simply. During the late 50s and early 60s, when China was in tremendous financial difficulty, there were a lot of Chinese people really starving. During all that period, Chairman Mao actually refused to eat meat. And for sports, Chairman Mao loved to play ping pong, swimming, and walking. Mr. Shen, what was Chairman Mao like when you were working for him? Uh, Mao Zhu Xi, Di Jing Wei Xian is very concerned. Di Jing Wei Xian is also very good. When Di Jing Wei Xian came to Mao, Di Jing Wei Xian was very kind. Chairman Mao was always very kind and considerate towards the security guards. Most of the guards were from the countryside and had very little schooling. Some couldn't even write letters home. So Chairman Mao established a night school for the security guards at Zhongnanhai to teach them how to read and write. He was the president of the school, and sometimes he even corrected the students' work himself, word by word, sentence by sentence. <laughs> After a few years, many of the students reached a high school level of education, and some of them even went on to universities. There was a time in China when portraits and statues of Mao were everywhere. Now, this is one of the few left in public places. After the Cultural Revolution, which set China back about 20 years in development, 
and with the scandal of the Gang of Four involving Mao's wife, the image of Chairman Mao and his doctrinaire Marxism became tarnished. With the advent of Deng Xiaoping and his pragmatic approach to socialism, a fresh wind seems to be blowing across the land. For many Chinese, this is the beginning of a new era. As China modernizes, the government is taking the needs of the disabled into consideration more and more. This was exemplified by the creation of the China Welfare Fund for the Handicapped, begun in 1984. I spoke with its co-founders, Wang Luguan and Deng Bufang. I asked them about the status of the disabled in China. Well, basically the Chinese government is trying to assure that handicapped people have sufficient food and clothing or at least to maintain their living conditions at a certain level. Of course, the present level is relatively low. The attitude of society towards handicapped people changes along with the society as a whole. When the society is stable, it gets better. Otherwise, it gets worse. Discrimination still exists in China. For example, some factories don't want to employ handicapped people. There is also a tendency in universities not to enroll handicapped students. As you know, college in China is free. Therefore, in order to get into college, one has to pass a physical examination. If you are not up to a certain standard, for instance, if you are handicapped, it would influence your acceptance. The situation was bad last year. This year, the government has revised the rules of the exam. So now the door is opening. Wang Xiangxiang, you are the co-founder of the Welfare Fund. When and why did you start this work? The Welfare Fund was set up on March 15, 1983. As everyone knows, China is undergoing economic reforms. The government encourages a diversified economy internally and advocates an open door externally. Under such circumstances, the issue of social welfare naturally arises, and obviously the issue of handicapped people becomes more important. glance, this factory looks and sounds like any other. Machines roar incessantly as bright plastic crystals are melted and poured into molds. But the people who work here perceive their factory differently, not because it is unusual in China, but because most of them are either deaf or blind. The Shanghai brand Electronic Elements Factory has 743 workers. 56% of them are disabled in some way. This is one of the many so-called welfare factories in China, set up in the 1950s to meet the need of these workers for employment. Like sheltered workshops here in the United States, this factory is designed to allow disabled workers to produce marketable goods in a safe environment. The parts they produce are put to use by manufacturers of electronic components and earn the factory over a million dollars in profit each year.